Hello, Equestrian Adventuresses. In today's episode, we talk to Susan from America, and she tells us about her experiences playing polo in Mexico and also about yoga and how it relates with horse riding. She also shares a fun story with us about the time she was traveling through Fiji and there was a coup happening in the country and she actually was basically escorted from the country. So that was a very interesting story. And she talks with us a lot of fun and interesting resources about how you can get started in the polo community if you haven't already tried it, because believe me, it's addictive and you're going to want to try this. Before we get started, I want to take a moment and ask you to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review so that others can find us. Check out our website for our podcast episode show notes and to read articles from amazing women having adventures on horseback just like you. Today's episode is brought to you by Utopiat. Check out their website for their Audrey Hepburn collection and stylish yoga mats. My absolute favorite is their Audrey Hepburn wool hat, which is the perfect accessory for attending the Argentine Open Polo Match. Check out their website, utopiat.com. That is U-T-O-P-I-A-T dot com. As usual, you can find the link in our show notes on equestrianadventuresses.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to join our Facebook group if you haven't already. This year, I will be traveling to some exciting destinations to film our upcoming YouTube documentary series, so be sure to keep checking in on our website for updates. And lastly, if you love what we do at EQA and you want to support us to help us continue to bring all this amazing free content, please consider becoming our premium member. For as little as a cup of coffee each month, your support really makes a difference. As a premium member, you'll have access to all of our bonus podcast episodes, our bonus YouTube behind-the-scenes footage, bloopers, all kinds of extra fun things. Check it out on our show notes and in our website at equestrianadventuresses.com. Thanks for listening, and cue the music. We are explorers. We are trailblazers. We love to do what cannot be done. We love to test our limits, cross borders, and we love the freedom horses bring us. We seek lands without fences. Who are we? We are equestrian adventuresses. We are a community of women who love horses, travel, and adventure. To infinity and beyond! And now your host, Crystal Kelly! Hello, adventuresses. I am talking today with Susan. She's actually in Colorado while I'm sitting here in England. So hello, Susan. Hello. And I wanted to talk to you. I mean, you have a whole lot of really cool things going on with polo. And, you know, I've I've played polo a little bit and I think it's a really exciting sport. So I just wanted to first, before we get into your adventures, you know, where did you, where are you from? And like, what is a little bit about yourself, like how you got into horses or into polo? Okay. Yes, I'm in Colorado now. I actually was born and raised in Colorado and um, was fascinated with horses from the time I can remember. And I remember people would ask me what I want to be when I grow up. And I would say a horse and they would say, oh, a veterinarian. And I said, no, a horse. And so <laughs> it was pretty much my, you know, what I aspired to. So I um, got my first Shetland when I was six and then, um, and rode Western and all the Jim Connors and things. Then there was a, a Morgan barn nearby. So I started writing English and, and jumping a little bit and, and then got out of it for years, but I missed it so much. Um, and would take any opportunity I could, I could to get on a horse. Um, actually lived in England for a little while and I was able to, um, uh, work out the, the hunt horses, which was fantastic, which was fabulous just this english countryside running to home is amazing right. so that's that's was, quite a, a brave uh sport to go into as well yeah especially after not riding that much for that many years but but it was a a, a quick education but right it was you fantastic. basically just hold on to these horses and yeah exactly. <laughs> pray yeah. you make it to the other side of these fences <laughs> exactly um and then it wasn't until i was um 
in my 30s, I went to my early 30s, I went to a wedding in the Dominican Republic and Casa de Campo has a fantastic polo facility, one of the resorts there. And they, the wedding party just as something to do to the, the day before took a, a polo lesson and I was just hooked immediately. And so um, I knew that I wanted to play in the future and it didn't really present itself for a few years, but I, I was living in Austin, Texas at the time. And I, I found a club there and just started playing. And I was a single mother and working and traveling a lot. So I, it was very sporadic how much I got to play, you know, sort of off and on, but I just loved it. And it was um, such a great way to connect with the horse. It was like, I also was a, a professional ski instructor for years and um, I guess a bit of an adrenaline junkie. And so it was so wonderful to have the horse, it was so many elements. I mean, working with the horse so much and the horse loves the game and it, horses that love the game are just so fun to play on because they, they're like 80% of the game <laughs> anyway, but they love it and they have so much fun. And, um, but you have the, the speed and the working with a horse and the teamwork and the strategy and like all these elements. So I don't know, it just, um, it captured me. You know, <laughs> it's I, very addictive. No, I also noticed, I mean, I can remember the first time that I sat on a polo pony. I was actually, so I was in Egypt and I was working at a show jumping stables and I just sort of got invited to the polo club and, and the owner of the polo club actually brought a polo pony out for me. And, you know, he had heard I was a professional rider. So he was just kind of like, you know, have a go. And I remember when I held the mallet and everything, there was just something about cantering around and trying my best to hit this darn little ball you know, on a cantering horse that it just like, you just get so hooked and the horses, like you said, I mean, they just ride. So I don't know. It's like amazing. They're just so well-trained. And like you said, they love what they do. Yeah, they really do. So, so when you got into the polo, did you sort of feel that, you know, like you said, it's an adrenaline rush, but also it's a, a team sport. and, And that's something that you weren't really experiencing in the other, I guess, sports you were doing. Yeah, the team sport aspect is is great, and um, I also sort of there's no mm, beauty contest. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like it, the, the score is what the score is, you know. So it's like, okay, you go out there, you win, you win, you lose, you lose. You know, you have good days, bad days, but it's like it doesn't matter what you look like or what your horse looks like or (laughs) right and the points don't even really matter because it's not like you win anything really (laughs) right I know it's just such a blast and the people that are that I've found that you know the majority of the people just are in it because they love horses and they love being with their horses and interacting with their horses so you know and there's a fun usually very fun community and like a saddles afterwards and you know barbecues and you know so it's a very um I don't know it's it's a I've, I've enjoyed the whole, the whole atmosphere of it as well. And just how much everybody is really horse centric and loves the horses. That's really the main, the main focus, you know, taking care of your horses. So you were in Texas and you started riding some polo ponies here and there when you could, when did you start Mm -hmm. branching out or I don't know, taking it a bit more serious? Um, probably about six years ago. Um, it was actually, Actually, this is, um, my fiance got leukemia. And so we were in MD Anderson for a year and, um, but there's a Houston has fantastic polo and he's such a doll. And so we, um, got horses there in Houston. And so every morning I would get up like at five 30 and go ride before, you know, all my horses and then come back to the hospital. And so we were in Houston. So I started playing, um, they have, I started playing the four goal there in the fall, which was just got me totally hooked because it's the first time I'd really played real organized professional polo. And, um, and it was, yeah, it was great. So then after that I played, um, I spent a summer in Jackson hole, which has this really fun polo, very family oriented and just gorgeous. And spent a summer in Santa Fe playing. And so just sort of played all over. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you started branching out in the U.S., and it sounds yes. like, I mean, you know, that was a very stressful time for you, going to the hospital and everything that was happening, and it sounds like, you know, polo was also your your escape, or... It was definitely my therapy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah, it was. I mean, horses are such amazing therapy anyway, but particularly at that point in my life, they were particularly powerfully therapeutic. Yeah, so. Wow. And, and I'm, you know, assuming, hoping everything got better and 
It did. And my fiance was such a doll. I mean, he, he really insisted on it. I was like, I was so focused on him. And he's like, no, we got to take care of you too. And so, right. Right. Wow. What a, what a good guy. So, so you're traveling in America. When was your first, let's say trip outside of America with, with horses? Oh, it was before that. Um, I went to Argentina, well, probably well, like 15 years ago, the first time, which was great for the, during November, during the open, which was so great because, um, I'm sure it's many of, well, maybe, well, it's fantastic to go to Argentina in the fall in November, <laughs> December, because the, uh, Argentine open is held then. And it's the, the best polo in the world. It's, you know, the Super Bowl of polo. It's, um, Argentina is the Mecca of polo and everywhere else you play, you always have a Patron. And so, um, you have three professional players and then one amateur player who pays for everything. Um, but at the Argentine open, it's all professional. So you have 10 goal is the highest rating you can get. You have, you may have, and there's four people on each side on each team. And so each team may have four 10 goalers or or, you know, a few eight and nine goalers sprinkled in. But so the play is just amazing. And then what also is so cool, I'm starting going on a tangent here. No, that's fine. What's so cool about, um, about watching it in, uh, in Palermo in, in Buenos Aires and in, in Argentina is, um, the, it's this huge stand, this huge stadium. Um, and they have two, two sort of boards up and one has the name of all the players and the other one has the name of all the horses. And these during, they, these, they play six chuckers. So six periods, each period is seven and a half minutes. Um, but they may, so novice polo, you know, you'll ride one horse, a chucker, but, um, as you move up to more competitive play and you know, they'll, they'll change horses. They'll come to the sideline and just jump from one horse to that. Their groom will have another horse at the sideline and they'll jump from one horse to the other because there's no timeouts to change horses. So they'll, you know, change horses three to five times a chucker. It's crazy. Um, but they have the, they have the names of the horses who are playing at the moment because the people in Argentina know the, the horses almost as well as the players, which I think is so wow. cool. <laughs> wow. That is very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it's also very fun because it's like the biggest, the whole, there's this huge Chandon, um, champagne bar underneath. So it's like the, the biggest champagne party you've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we it's go. Very fun. <laughs> so, but the great thing about going then too, is there's a lot of estancias, estancias down there that you can go and play polo during the week. Um, you know, play two times a day and I've asados and things. And then, um, and then go watch the tournament on the weekends. So, you know, you can maybe go down for like 10 days. And Yeah. So anyway, so Argentina, yeah, I went once about um, 15 years ago. And then I went about maybe about, I don't know, nine years ago or something to with uh, down to Argentina again. And I went with um, Memo Gracia, who's one of the best polo players of all time. I went to his, um, his program, La Aradura and, it was just fantastic. So, so what's it like so, when yeah. you when you go there to Argentina to actually you know ride and play polo? What was your I don't know routine like in the day? Oh, it depends on where you stay, but yeah, you get up in the morning and you go stick and ball. Usually, you know, they'll have some breakfast and then you go stick and ball. So you're practicing, and they usually you know they'll give you basically giving you lessons and stick and ball, and then go to lunch, and then in the afternoon you play a game. And they have fantastic horses. So, yeah, it's it's great. Very nice. There's some, yeah. So, so you're starting to branch out into Argentina um, with polo. Mm-hmm. When did you start, I don't know, seeking polo matches or other polo clubs? Um, oh, just as any, any spare time I had. <laughs> um, yeah, I... Um, really probably the last six years, the, the, the sad part right now is we, we moved to Colorado for, um, for a work project and where I'm living in Colorado, there is no polo, which, um, actually is one of the reasons why I, I branched. I, I'm playing in, I'll play, I think I'm going to play this summer in Denver and I played, um, some charity matches last year in California and I played in 
Florida. And um, so I, I've just been going in and popping in and playing, but I, I haven't been able to ride every day and, you know, keep my game up or improve my game or anything. So it's sort of frustrating. So really the last two years is when I started the polo and yoga, because I sort of was having a, I was, I needed that polo connection because it was such a part of my life and my happiness. So I'm like, okay, well, I don't have polo at my back door right now. So what can I do to keep me connected and, and, you know, and help share it with other people. So, so then where did the, the yoga, so I'm also, I do yoga and I really see the connection between yoga and horses. So were you doing yoga before you did polo or how did this play into it? Um, I sort of have done, yeah, I've done yoga ever since I have done polo. I've been into yoga for years and years. And then, um, I was certified several years ago and I just thought it's such a, I just thought, you know what I'd like, I, they say sort of live your dream. And I said, I want to combine the things I love, which are polo, yoga and travel. And I want to share it with other people. (laughs) So that was like, okay. So so where did, where did you take this? this adventure so um we had our first one this february in costa carreas mexico which is this beautiful uh little town little resort on the pacific side it's in between if anybody knows mexico puerto vallarta and manzanillo but um yeah it's it's beautiful and they have fantastic polo facilities and how did this start like how did you choose that place in mexico how did this conversation even happen um, I knew, a, I, I was looking at a lot of different places and I just thought, what would be really fun for people to go and where do I know they have great polo? Um, and actually my friend Memo Gracida, he, uh, I knew he was good friends with the, the owners, uh, Giorgio Brigioni. And so I asked if him for an introduction and he was kind enough to give it to me. So, um, yeah, so I, talked to Giorgio and he said, and he, Giorgio, the owner of, of uh, Careas loves yoga as well. She's like, Oh my God, that's a fantastic idea. So it was like, yay. So we were off. <laughs> so when I'm so. thinking of Mexico and maybe this is, uh, I mean, I grew up in California. We have a lot of Mexican influence, but I've not actually been to Mexico. But when I think of it, I don't think of it as being like a community of women traveling for polo. So how, 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 how is this in Mexico? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, so far it's been all Americans, but I'm hoping that that's going to change. I've been, I've been, um, advertising and promoting both in the UK and, and, um, and in Mexico through, through different avenues and would like to expand that, you know, Instagram, but, um, yeah, so there are some women that play, but we, our, our group was all all Americans this year. And, and what did the Mexicans think when, you know, a whole bunch of, I don't know, did you have ladies or mixed men and women, or what did they think when they saw ladies come in and playing polo? Um, not, they have a women's tournament there every year anyway. And so they're, they're quite used to it at Correa's. I'm not sure about how much at the other clubs they are used to women playing, but yeah, Correa's, <laughs> no, they're very, very supportive. And the, there's a woman who runs the polo school, Susan Stovall. She's amazing. She's organized um, polo f- clubs for years and years in California. Some of the well, some of the largest polo clubs in the you know in the country in the U.S. So she's amazing, and their horses are fantastic. I was, I have to say, I was very pleasantly surprised. They were amazing. And what did your your fiance or your husband think when you said I'm gonna go to Mexico and open a a yoga polo <laughs> adventure. <laughs> well, he was extremely supportive other than what about our real job? <laughs> I was like, Oh yeah, I can still do the real job. I promise. I promise. I promise. So yeah. So I've been working it in between our other jobs and we really, um, and I'm doing it, which is really fun. I asked one of my best friends from actually we, we met in high school and we've just been super close forever. She, she actually lives in, uh, in uh, Playa de Carmen, Mexico now, but she asked her, we've been looking, we've been looking for something to do together um, that was um, sort of giving back, philanthropic, something that we could do. And so finally I was like, well, let's just do this and let's just make sure every time we do one, we find a cause that we give back to. And, you know, that will sort of be our, our 
sort of our driving force platform, you know. So this time, like in Costa Carreas, they have an amazing foundation called the Carreas Foundation, and they um, teach English to the 12 different villages around around the resort, and they have um, mountain biking for all of the kids. They have a choir um a, a, yeah, a choir group. They have art. They have filmmaking because Costa Carreras has a film festival every year too. So they have filmmaking. So this um, foundation is fantastic. So the first night of the of the polo yoga adventure, we had um, the kids' choir come. It was like forty little kids um, singing, and they sang for us and on the plaza. It was so cute. So you know, just um, you know, letting the the guests our our guests know about the foundation. It was great because they all donated and yeah. So anyway, that's our goal is to wherever we do go, we we find some some local charity to partner with to try and get back a little bit. But, I think that's yeah. really great. I actually that's one of the things with um my travels as well that I've always loved involving the locals and you know it's not just about it, it's so great to see what horses you know, they, they make you feel so vulnerable and they nurture us and they're just so wonderful animals. You know, they're so giving that I think it makes people want to give as well. Right. I think so, too. I never made really thought about that connection, but I think it's very true. Yeah. So do you have any like, I don't know, maybe fun stories about some of the, the things in Mexico that you guys are experiencing or what was it like? Yeah, it was fantastic. So every morning we get up. um Oh my gosh, we stayed in this gorgeous home that had, you know, many bedrooms and we um would do yoga out on the on the patio over the overlooking the 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 infinity pool that looked out on the ocean. It was just incredible. Um and so every morning we do yoga and then we'd go and stick and ball. Um and then we'd come back and they'd fix us lunch and you could go for a swim if you wanted, whatever. Um, and then we'd go in the afternoon and play four checkers, which was so much fun. And they have some great pros down there too. So it really keeps the ball moving. Um, and then one, like one day we went after riding, we went to, they have a, uh, sea turtle sanctuary. So we went and, um, released baby sea turtles into the ocean, which was so Aww. much fun. <laughs> They're so cute. And then um, another day after Chuckers, we uh, everybody got on a, a, a horse and we did a beach ride, like a half an hour. You go through the jungle and then off to the beach, and then they uh, we ride up to this little this old this old cabin. It's it's crazy. It's been there for hundreds of years. It's sort of back off the beach. It's wild looking. But the ins- but the food is amazing and the clientele it's so funny you think you are in New York or something it's insane it's very <laughs> but um and then and they'll take they took the horses back and so we got to have dinner and margaritas and so yeah and yeah there was so many fun things we went to another little village and um went to a you know one of their markets and had lunch on the beach and yeah, just mixed it up a little bit it was fun and the yeah. And, oh, and we'd also do stretches after yoga. I mean, after polo every afternoon. Um, Casablanca gave me these great towels for everybody to use. They're polo towels, but they work great for for a little stretch after on the field afterwards. And um, it's oh my gosh, I don't know why I don't do that now. From now on, I will because I always stretch a little bit. But actually, like getting down and stretching out after made it felt so good. So anyway. We'd have a little stretch, and then we'd go do whatever our next activity was. It's fun. And I have noticed with the polo, because you twist a lot in the saddle, which it's funny, like in show jumping, you just don't twist your body side to side to hit a ball. So I I noticed that when I started, I would get sort of sore in my lower back. Um, Oh, yeah. And right between your shoulder blades. Because I don't think there's – I've never found enough, like in the middle of your spine, that twisting. I definitely felt that the yoga really helped with that. Yeah. Yeah. I broke, I broke it, broken it down to sort of six elements, um, of yoga that I think are like directly related to polo and probably every sport, but, you know, starting with, you know, your breath, um, and then, um, your core, your, you know, uh, your core and your, and then twisting and then flexibility and balance 
and then drishti, you know, focus because, you know, so much about just being in tune with your body will help you be more in tune with your horse. So it's, it's part of the yoga is very physical, you know, the, the twisting, the core, the stability, um, and the breathing also will help you, you know, have the stamina, but it's also bringing it back internally and, and really being present. One of the biggest things I think is, you know, before you start really breathe and tune in, tune into yourself, that will help you turn into your horse. That will help you tune into your, to your teammates. Um, and, uh, it will help you become present because, you know, we spend so much time and money doing whatever, activity it is that we're passionate about, but sometimes we're so rushed, like we're rushing from work to get there. We're, we're, we're so, you know, that we don't, that we don't really fully enjoy it because we don't become present and enjoy every moment of it. So I think that is, is, is key. And, you know, also the focus, the drishti to, to again, about, you know, focus on the ball, on the play, on the, but also focus on being present and, you know, appreciating your horse, appreciating all of it. So I think there's both the physical and the sort of spiritual side of yoga that, that can enhance, you know, enhance polo very much. And have you seen uh, results from the riders or from your students, you know, that have done yoga and then they go and they ride their horse and they're just more centered and balanced and yeah, and feel so much better afterwards too. <laughs> like, oh my God, I don't hear, I don't hurt nearly as bad as I thought I would. Right, yeah, so, and fewer falls, yeah. I hope. <laughs> yes, or at least they're limber goal. when they do take a tumble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can duck and roll better. Yeah. yeah, the art of falling, what every horse person needs to know. <laughs> yes, exactly. And in Mexico, had you traveled around within the country before choosing this spot, or? I actually lived in Mexico City for six years. So, um, yeah, so I've been to Polo. Um, I actually, I lived in Mexico City before I started playing, right before I started playing Polo, unfortunately, because they have great Polo in Mexico City, or outside of Mexico City. But I only went and saw one game there. But, um, so yeah, I've been, I've traveled extensively all across um, Mexico. So I'm very, I'm fluent in Spanish and very comfortable with the country and everything so and, and what was it like living there what were you doing were you working or I was working I went down originally I had just finished my MBA and I went down to work for a large uh, Spanish newspaper um, Spanish language newspaper in Mexico City and then after about a year of that I started my own company down there for I did PR and marketing for US and UK firms that wanted to reach the high-end Mexican market so I lived there for five more years doing my own business, and I loved it. I love Mexico. Was there the a lot of complications? I mean, you have to – I don't know. When I worked in India, there was, like, alternate ways of doing things versus in America. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> At pretty much everything. <laughs> Right. And I, where I got my MBA was uh, an international MBA. So there were, um, you know, there were students from – Oh, I, almost every country and every work group that they had, they tried to make sure there was no one else from your country in it. And so it was very eye opening and, and just, it was fantastic to be working and you, you expect sort of Western European com countries to, I mean, Eastern European, you know, to have sort of the same, same perspective on things, but it's just different. Everybody has a different perspective and way of doing things. And yeah. So in Mexico, especially being um, a, a female and working and, the business world was, yeah, there was a lot of workarounds. <laughs> Do you have a, a story or an example of maybe when you first got there, you had a workaround? Oh, yeah. I, my boss, um, I realized pretty quickly that if I wanted to see any change at all, I needed to make sure I needed to figure out a way. So it appeared like it was his idea and then commend him on what a brilliant idea it was <laughs> and then my right. chances of getting something done increased phenomenally <laughs> right. yeah that's sort of for, for women anywhere in the world but it's it's amplified in some places yeah and what was it like living in Mexico City like what's the vibe there I loved it I mean it was it was dangerous but um you know you just be super careful and but the people they really I love the culture, they really, um, they work to live. They don't live to work, which is so much more prevalent in the U S I mean, the culture, it's, it's very much about family and, and community and being happy and, 
fiesta, you know, and not fiesta like, oh, let's party all the time, but just enjoy life, you know, I don't know. It's, so I loved it. It's, it's been my, I, I grew up in a family that was very much like that. And so I sort of felt like, oh, I'm home. <laughs> So. And when you went to work in in Mexico, did your was your family really nervous? Like, oh no, you're gonna die or whatever? You know the stereotypical. No, no not really. My parents, um, like, were they loved traveling and they instilled that in us and traveled with us a lot. And I had already lived out of the country for. I lived in England twice, and I lived in Spain, and I lived in New Zealand. I taught skiing in New Zealand and traveled all through Australia, and um, I taught skiing in Argentina as well. And um, so I had been traveling for internationally for and living and working for years. So they you know it was it wasn't any big surprise to them. <laughs> they were used like, to just, it. yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was yeah. And I, I guess it's easy for them to come and visit you. Oh, it's so much easier than, yeah, like New Zealand or some of the other places I was. So, yeah, it was great. And were you traveling around within Mexico, exploring some of the sites? Or? Every every opportunity I got, every weekend pretty much trying to go somewhere and really trying to get, I mean, all the colonial cities are fantastic, but also, you know, sort of off the beaten path. And that side of Mexico is just so magical and enchanting. It's there. It's a, yeah, it's a very culturally rich country. I just love it. Do you have any special hidden gems, like secrets that you can share with us? <laughs> oh, Valle de Bravo is a is a lake a few hours from Mexico City. That is just it's up in the mountains. It's not what you would think of Mexico at all. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, Costa Carreras is a very it's a hidden gem. Well, it's not so hidden, but it is it's fantastic. Um, and then like Oaxaca. Is the the Oaxaca is amazing as well. So what what is that? You go. Oaxaca is a, it's actually a state, but it's also a, a city. Um, and the it has uh, Monte Alban, the these ruins, these ancient ruins that are there that they. Um, oh, I'm gonna. I don't <laughs> even. They, they, they're they're very they're ancient. I don't know. There's just so much so much rich culture that's it's fascinating. All right, and how's how are the the people and the you know the culture? Like you said, it's a little bit more easygoing. Or yeah, not as yeah. Was it difficult for you yeah, to travel just, around as a woman? Or? No, not at all. No. Uh -uh. I mean, just I, you know, as as you know, being a woman and traveling, you just always you always have to be smart, you know. But I traveled everywhere I traveled. I was on my own. All, all the countries that I lived in, I lived in on my own. And I think it's traveling up by yourself is is really a gift, even though at times you wish you had, you know, your buddies there for sure. But it's you're so much more approachable that you meet so many more people. And it's what's, you know, I went on semester at sea as well, where we went to 13 different countries. And what always amazes me in traveling and just warms my heart is that people are so innately good and, and, and want to help you. And, you know, many of these countries like, you know, South Korea and Taiwan and where I couldn't even come close to speaking the language. And it's amazing how much sign language can get you and just a smile. And, you know, it, it just, yeah, I just love, I love traveling and it does it for me, it, uh, rekindles your sense of, okay, we all are one. It's, we all are one. It's all good. And and do you have any examples of maybe a person that you met while you were traveling around in Mexico that just really embraces this, you know, captures this story, what you're saying, you know, that they were so hospitable and oh. every, it seems like so many people just are so hospitable in, in Mexico. It's crazy. I remember one story in Taiwan. It was crazy. I know this doesn't have anything to do with Mexico, but, um, <laughs> my friend and I got off this bus and we didn't know we asked for directions and these two young girls that were, they were trying, you know, they were practicing their English and they said, Oh, we'll take you. And they took us on a, a bus ride. I think stopped their whole day. I think, I don't know where are they, they, they were going somewhere obviously. And they took us down to the seaside, to this village and they kept trying to, you know, pay for everything for us. And they were just so sweet. And they were like, we just, you know, everybody's always just, we just hope you love our country. And, you know, I had so many experiences.
experiences like that. It's heartwarming. Yeah, I think that's one of the special things oh, that we all love yeah. about travel. Definitely. Yeah. Another I again I was coming back from New Zealand and Australia and stopped in um Fiji and I got stuck there during a coup. I went to the main island and I I you know, wanted to stay at Beachcomber, this little island a little another week, but I didn't realize so I Changed, I canceled my flight and I didn't realize there was a coup going on in the mainland. So I got there and there wasn't there wasn't a single seat out for like three months. And so this um, young Fijian girl at the airport, I, it was like midnight after midnight, and the, the flight left that I was waiting on. And she's like, "You don't know where to go, do you? do you?" And I was like, "No." And she said, "Well, come home with me." And she took me to her little house that was nothing. I ended up staying for like three weeks and they, her and her family, and they took me to another part. They took such good care of me. I met another Nor- Norwegian girl at the airport. Cause I kept going back to try and see if I could get a seat. And, um, she ended up joining me. So these, this, like this, these families took such good care of us. And we went to, to, you know, to church with them. We went to the bars with them. We just, we, they were so hospitable. And then finally one day, cause literally I could not get a ticket out for, for three months was my seat. And I was there about three weeks and we were at one of the uh, the bars and this family had three young girls. They were so cute and so sweet. And one of the, their friends was said, do you want to leave? Do you want to go back to America? And I was like, yeah, that, I need to get back there. <laughs> my job is starting. I was teaching, I was teaching skiing in Vail and I needed to get back quickly. I was, um, so, uh, he said, well, we'll, we'll get you on a flight tomorrow. And I was, there's not even a Qantas flight tomorrow. He said, no worries. And we'll pick you up. And he, they picked us up in their army jeep and took me and my friend, um, Hardenberg, And we went to, and they took us out to the runway to this Air Canada flight. We didn't even have a ticket for <laughs> and put us in the first seats in first class. And we flew to Hawaii. We're like, oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah, it was crazy. Wow. That, that so, sounds very special. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, you're, so you're in Fiji and this coup is happening. Were you far from the coup or did you somehow see any of it? Well, or? it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't really, um, they called it a coup and it, but it wasn't like there was some military, but there wasn't really any fighting or anything. There was just a lot of military presence and they were, I think it was more of a political drama than it, thank goodness. And it was physical, you know, but, um, yeah, but everybody was trying to get out, um, out of the country. And to, what was it like for you? I, I mean, living, every seat was full. yeah, but living with the, the family and you know, what were their thoughts on what was happening or for them? Was it just kind of like, Oh, it will pass. And it made fine. me a project because they were Fijians and it, you know, it was the turmoil was between the Fijians and the Indians on the Island. And so obviously my, my empathy and sympathy was much more on the Fijian side because that's what I was experiencing. And, um, but they were amazing. But things like, you know, they, she brought me home from the, the airport that night. And, um, uh, and she was so sweet. They gave me the only bed in the house. You know, I'm like, no. And, I, and the next morning, she's like, do you want coffee? And I was like, sure. And then she says, do you want sugar? And she gave me the sugar. And there were ants running all through it, which I guess they are just used to, extra protein. You know, I'm like, I'm good with black. But, you know, and like, I remember I went to bed that night. And there was a spider that was like, four inches, you know, in diameter. And I, and I went and then I went to the bathroom and then I came back and the spider, I couldn't see the spider, which was even worse. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God, is it a deadly spider? Is it? So yeah. Just little things like that. But they were, um, they were just amazing. The, the family was fantastic. And and have yeah. you heard from the them joys. or kept in touch since leaving? Or? No, which, no, which makes, I wish so badly. This was pre Facebook. And I'm so bummed because now I really I don't have contact with any of them, and I would love, love, love to. So, as much as social media can have its downfalls, it's so great because I I wish I could contact those people now. Yeah, no, but, it sounds amazing. I think yeah. you know when we're yeah. traveling and we have those, especially women, these like mother figures or sister figures, and they just sort of step in and, and protect you like mama bears, you know. Bringing back into the horsey polo vibe, um, have you? Ridden mm-hmm. and played polo in other countries. I played in Argentina and Mexico, and um, no, I need to play in more countries. I played in Hawaii. Um, 
but no, I need to play. And I, but my goal is to play in many more countries. And I was, um, yeah, it's a polo community is so wonderful because it's, it's such a, a sort of small type community that it's easy to find some way to connect to, um, to people wherever you're traveling and, and get an introduction to the people who own the polo clubs in that area. So, so my goal is to play many more places and hopefully take lots of other women along. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about the polo yeah. community and especially like the lady polo that's, that's starting. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. It's, um, there's many more women getting into polo now and the, the USPA, the US, um, US United States for Polo Association, the female demographic is the fastest growing demographic by far and has been several years. And it's fantastic. And what that also has brought is there's many more women's tournaments as well um, and women's series. And, um, and there's a great new organization that just launched last fall. It's a platform, a, you know, internet platform. It's called uh, International Polo Network. So it's WIPN.com, and um, it is fantastic. You, it's a free – you sign up for free, put your profile on, and then it, there's educational pieces. There's interviews of different players, but one of the greatest things is it tells you of all the women's tournaments all over the world. And so if you want to go play in a women's tournament where wherever, you know, in, in France, in, in, uh, you know – anywhere um kenya anywhere you can go and look at what tournaments are there and then also there's often you know tournaments are looking for players of a certain level and the other great thing is is it's for it's not just for um polo existing polo players it's also if you want to maybe you want to try polo but you don't know how um it can give you a list of of clubs near you where you can go and, and you know take a trial lesson and usually most of the clubs have some um you know free have a free lesson and then you know you can get a, a series of of lessons for for not too much and it is an expensive sport but there are ways to um to you know there's arena leagues which they you play polo in an arena and it's three on three players so three players on each team as opposed to four players it's still a large arena it's 150 yards so um it's large but it tends to be um a little less expensive they also play it in in the winter when you can't play so i encourage anybody who wants to look into polo um yeah to get on wipn and there's just some fun stories too and and the community of women is um is great wipn was started by don jones um and yeah, it, anyway, it's a great, it's a great resource to have. And it's, I think it's really going to help bring the women's polo community internationally together, which is fantastic. So for somebody that hasn't played polo or hasn't given it a go yet, what's the difference between like, I mean, obviously ladies polo is for ladies, but you know, what's the importance of that? And what have you experienced when you're playing, you know, playing in these ladies tournaments? Oh, um, they're just the, the, it's a ton of women that love horses and are sort of the same, um, energy <laughs> type as you, you know, so it's just, it's a very fun group usually. And the tournaments are usually there's great swag bags. <laughs> They're great <laughs> events. It's so funny. They usually have the best parties. They have a lot of really good parties. It just is a very, they're usually very fun. Yeah, I've actually noticed when I've they're played, like all... when I've played with men, they they get very, you know, serious mm -hmm. about winning and they're very macho and they're like ramming into each other. Whereas with the ladies, I mean, we can be pretty tough mm -hmm. as well, but I feel like there's a lot of encouraging and like you go and yay and you know it's like such a a different vibe. I yeah, would say. there is a lot of encouraging, but oh my god, on the on the field no it's it's still brutal <laughs> i think pretty much all of them are still really 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 competitive but um but, yeah, but as soon as you get off it's like okay that was that game and let's uh, yeah Good job. let's go to the party so <laughs> there's one other organization that's really cool that i'm just going to bring up it's called work to ride and um they have it in the states it was started in I think, 1994 in philadelphia but it's uh it was started right outside the city. It's a program that kids from the 
the city could come and, you know, work at the stable and then for working the stable, they would teach them polo. And they've, it's, um, they've started in several other cities now too. And it's just fantastic. And one of their kids, I think his name is Kareem Rosser, but he went on to, um, when he played for Colorado state university in Fort Collins and he, they went on to win the intercollegiate national championship just a few years ago. And he got to play with, um, with Prince William and Prince Harry. He, they, he was invited over to play with them. And so, um, yeah, so that's, there's some, some good programs out there like that as well. And yeah. I think you had it's mentioned that, that you rode or you played polo in Thailand as well. Yeah. How did you find out that there was a polo club there and how did you make, I don't know, book the ticket? A, f- a friend that I was um, stick and balling with in Austin actually had just come back from Thailand and had been um, had been playing there. So he gave me the introduction and um, I was already planning a trip to Thailand and Cambodia. So I was like, okay, got to fit it in. <laughs> sort of the goal, any trip, try to see if you can fit in a couple of days of polo. When you go to a, a country like go Thailand, um, I don't know, I think a lot of people would think that it's, I don't know, a third world country or something. What is the, the polo club like? Is it just, I don't know. Very, uh, very nice. Very, very nice. I mean, I think you'll get different things in different different countries, but no, this one is extremely um, like luxurious. Extremely sophisticated. Uh-huh. And, yes. and is the polo, is it something that you can just, I don't know, find polo clubs around the world and call them up and say, hey, can I come and play polo with you? Or what's what's that like? I think you probably could. I've never tried that route, but I think, yeah, they're always open to any, you know, and probably the best way to get in is, um, you know, can I take a lesson or do you have a you know, do you have a lesson or do you have a, and then you can, you know, cause then you're actually, you're paying them for something and you get to see the place. And then once you're there, you can ask about, you know, chuckers you can get on or stick and ball that you can take or, or even just going and just going and experiencing different clubs. And, and also it's a great way to meet locals that, you know, you have something in common with, you know? And so even if you just go take a lesson and you get to see a whole new facility, a whole new way of, of, uh, you know, whole new environment of polo. And, and you get to meet some locals that, like I said, are, have some similarity, have some similar passions as you do. Great. So any new adventures lined up or travel plans? Um, I, I am hoping maybe to play in India next year. I'm not, not certain on that yet, but I'm hoping, um, I'm probably playing in Denver this summer. I think I hope to go to a couple of tournaments. Maybe, um, I played in a tournament in California last summer, so I might, um, uh, play in that again. So I don't know what, anything I can get my hands on and I can fit time into my schedule. I think I definitely will. And then we'll definitely having the Costa Carreas next year, um, next February. And you know what? Oh, the other thing about that is um, with the Polo and Yoga Adventures, we encourage um, not only polo players, but people who maybe want to learn to play polo. And also you can bring people, you know, friends, spouses, whatever, that don't want to get near a horse. There's so many other things to do. There's, you know, tennis, paddle boarding, mountain biking, spa. There's just a million things to do. Um, Snorkeling, fishing, all sorts of things. So um, and we had this year, we had one woman who had never played polo she rode when she was younger like you know from 12 to 16 she went to summer equestrian camp but she hadn't been on a horse since and um she came and she loved it and she did amazing and she was it was crazy by the end of the four days she was smacking the ball it was just it was so exciting to see it it was crazy so you can come if you want to if you've never ridden a horse and you just want to you want to learn to ride a horse you know, just started playing polo, any, you know, any level. What's your website or where can people follow you or find you? So polo and yoga.com. And then, um, Instagram is polo and yoga. Again, the and is written up. Great. So polo and yoga.com. That's where we can find out about your Mexico adventures. So it was really nice talking to you and thanks for joining me today.
Did Susan's story make your feet itch? Do you want to find amazing horse riding places all around the world? Then make your dreams come true with our free download, Horse Riding in Every Country. This directory features 400 different stables, actually more than that, in over 180 different countries. And I will be including a link in the show notes, so be sure to check it out and also check it out on our website, equestrianadventuresses.com. I'm going to include all of the links for today's show. You have been listening to the Equestrian Adventuresses podcast. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website, equestrianadventuresses.com, for links to the show notes. Leave us a review and consider becoming a premium member for bonus episodes and footage. More information can be found on our website. Until next time, adventuresses, happy trails. Happy trails.